where should channel migrants be housed? Do we still need oil and gas? And tackling a big increase in dog attacks. This is Politics Live. Joining me today, Conservative Deputy Chairman Matt Vickers, Labour MP Dan Jarvis, Alba Party leader Alex Salmond and Conservative Homes Emily Carver. On the programme today. It cannot be right that uh, people coming here, uh, particularly when they're coming here illegally, are housed in hotels at a cost of £6 million a day. Can using airfields, boats and barges cut the migrant hotel bill? Do we need to stop using oil and gas now if we want to get to net zero? Seeing what it's done to my family and his friends, that's got to stop. We can't let this keep happening. How can more deaths by killer dogs be avoided? We are one team and we will be the team. We will be the generation that delivers independence for Scotland. We'll ask this former First Minister if Hamza Yusuf can succeed where he failed. Our current wait time for a doctor is seven and a half hours. And are we losing faith in the NHS? And, of course, we'll have live coverage of Prime Minister's questions, which today is the clash of the deputies. Uh, Dominic Raab for the government and Angela Rayner for Labour. The Prime Minister and the Labour leader are at the former Speaker Betty Boothroyd's funeral today. Let's start uh, with the story on uh, quite a few of the front pages. This is how The Sun is reporting it. Exclusive. Illegal migrants plan. Oh, ship, which you can see there on the front, small boat arrivals across the channel to live on barges to cut, they say, three and a half billion pound hotel bill. Uh, the Mail has this headline, migrants to be housed on cruise ships and barges. We are expecting a statement this afternoon, in fact, shortly after PMQs uh, from the Immigration Minister to outline the plans uh, to reduce what they are saying the government is a £6 million a day bill on hotel accommodation for migrants who arrive, mainly on small boats across the Channel. Now, the plans are still quite sketchy, uh, but bearing in mind there are over 51,000 asylum seekers and migrants being housed in 390 95 hotels and at the moment we're being told it's only going to be for new arrivals. Will this plan cut the hotel bill? Well, it's a two-part plan, isn't it? What we voted on last night with the illegal immigration bill that will stop the boats, uh, it will detain people, return them to their country or a safe country. That's mm. part of the plan. We, we went from a few years ago having 300 people come across that channel to having 45,000. Mm. That's the key part of the plan. And now we're following up. We cannot continue yeah. to house people in hotels at a cost of £6 million a day. It's not acceptable. And actually, we'll follow the lead of other countries across Europe who are accommodating people in similar sorts of accommodation. You say it's not acceptable. I don't understand how this plan if you're not going to be uh, moving the asylum seekers, the over 51,000 that are in these hotels, if you're not going to be moving them and it's only going to be for new arrivals, how's it going to cut the bill? We, we, are in a, we, we have a terrible challenge of dealing what we, with where we are. Mm. We're putting money in now to have more processing done. We're putting people in the Home Office to process those applications more quickly. And the reality is we can't continue to leave people in hotels, A, because of the huge cost at £6 million a day, but B, because it has a huge impact on local economies that are reliant upon tourism in areas now where hotels are now full of asylum seekers. We need to make that change and we're making it. Uh, Dan, it will cut the cost, uh, won't it, eventually. I mean, I don't know how long it will take, but it will cut that cost because it is huge. £6.2 million a day is the estimate from the government. Well, let's see what the detail of the government's proposals are. They've briefed the newspapers, but not yet Parliament. We'll look very carefully and, and see what we think is, is the best way forward. There are a number of things the government should be doing, both in terms of putting additional capacity into the system, so the decisions about people's status could be made much more quickly. We need a good, close working relationship with our neighbours 
neighbours and allies in France. And we also need to be doing much more to stabilise the countries uh, in which some of the people who are seeking to come uh, to this country um, for, uh, uh, in order to try and um, uh, reduce the number of people who are coming. We had a, a statement yesterday from the minister specifically regard uh, for people coming from Afghanistan. You know, the government have had 18 months to put in place mm. a sustainable arrangement. Uh, the legal routes that they often talk about aren't working in the way that we should. So we'll look at the detail, but um, it's hard not to conclude at this stage that this is the politics of, of, of a gimmick, really, rather than a kind of serious attempt to bring forward a viable solution to what is admittedly a very complex problem. Housing migrants, Alex Salmond, in um, or on barges, on ships, in RAF bases, mm. is going to be cheaper, isn't it? It'll still have a cost, but it will be cheaper, won't it? It'll bring down that huge bill of paying for hotel accommodation. Not necessarily. I mean, actually, it's fundamentally more expensive to house people at sea than it is on land, believe it or not. And we'll see, we'll see if the government's worked out where they're going to get the barges, where they're going to get the cruise ships. Uh, I suspect you'll find that this is not about cost. This is just about dog whistle politics. This is about talking about migration. The government believes if they keep talking about it, they'll <coughs> expose Labour's weakness on it, and that will get them votes. It's, it's really bad politics, incidentally. It's probably bad organisation. It's very, very cynical. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the idea of going ships is, uh, is, will be more expensive, actually. Mm. And the idea of going to camps, of course, it's not that long since the, the major controversies and scandals about the conditions and, uh, uh, and encampments. None of this is the real issue. This is all about uh, the politics of the next election and the Tory party uh, wanting to dog whistle to their supporters. Has the Scottish Government ever used ferries? Oh, yes, and, uh, and that was a controversy as well mm. in terms of... Uh, but did it work? Refugees. Not, not particularly, no. They've now been mm. taken off the ferries <laughs> and put on to accommodation on land. In fact, there's probably a, a good lesson uh, up north as to what not to do uh, that the government would be well advised to take, uh, take heed of. What's your view in terms of cutting the cost, since that's certainly how it's been billed uh, and briefed to the papers? I'm not sure it's fair what Alex said about it just being cynical politics, because the government have obviously looked at opinion polls, spoken to the public, and this is one of their top priorities, wanting to stop the small boat crossings. Another pr issue it, that concerns people up and down the country is the use of hotels for the cost, but also for the resources that are needed from local authorities that can't then go to local people. It's hugely expensive. It's hugely costly in terms of time, resources for local authorities to deal with, and that needs to be taken under control. But I do think whether they use ferries or barges or former cruise ships mm. or RAF um, uh, bases. bases. Um, this will all be challenged by many people because oh, well. people will question whether this is responsible, whether it's safe, whether it's humane, etc., etc. But the system of hotels clearly isn't working. Yeah, if it wasn't cynical, then why was this briefed to every newspaper mm. last night? I mean, they, well, they, they, they still, I mean, every single newspaper has mm. this in their headlines. But I mean, it hasn't, that, that it hasn't gone unnoticed, yes, um, it has to be said, uh, hence showing a, a few of them. Let's talk about climate change because tomorrow uh, the government will announce updated plans on how it hopes to achieve net zero. Uh, some of this morning's newspapers are previewing that report. Let's have a look at the Yorkshire Post. A green day drive to achieve net zero. Carbon capture plans could benefit Yorkshire industry. Um, we're going to welcome Phoebe Plummer from Just Stop Oil. We'll come to you, Phoebe, in just a moment. First of all, Matt, the Yorkshire Post uh, mentions carbon capture, a process uh, to reduce the release of carbon dioxide when burning fossil fuels. That indicates that oil and gas isn't going uh, away anytime soon. Why not? Do you know what? We've got a really... I know it doesn't sell papers, and I know it not, it might not even be good broadcasting material, but actually oh, we've well, got a hell of a good me. record, a hell of a good record on the environment. Uh, we are decarbonising faster than anyone else in the G7. We were the first major economy to legislate net stalled. zero. That, that, that's certainly what climate scientists and even uh, members of the Conservative Party are saying, like your colleague Chris Skidmore, it's halted, it's stalled, that process. We have the world's leading offshore wind sector, and actually... The challenges of today are not just about group. We've got to do everything we can to be responsible with our climate, mm -hmm. but we've also got other priorities. And actually, we've got to make it work where it works. In my part of the world, we are about to build one of the world's biggest factories, creating 2,250 jobs, yeah. creating monopiles for that. The world leading offshore wind sector. We're doing a hell of a lot on this front. We've got a really proud record. All right, well, Phoebe, I've introduced you. What do you think of the record as set out by Matt? Hi, thank you so much for having me on. As you say, I'm Phoebe, I'm 21, I'm from London and a supporter of Just Stop Oil. 
We are demanding that the UK government immediately halts all new fossil fuel licences. And any less than that that's announced on Friday is a complete failure and a betrayal of me and my generation. And I think it's clear that we are not leaders in energy policy. We are going back to the dark ages with our energy, opening up a new coal mine. The government is looking to approve the Rosebank oil field. Mm. It's a, continue, continuing to drill for new oil and gas is an act of genocide and the government knows it. Right, an act of genocide uh, for drilling gas and oil. Any new licences, Matt? In 2010, we were taking about 7% of our energy supply from renewables. We're now taking 40%. We've made massive strides forward. We're leading the world in this, in this debate, in this issue. Uh, and I'm, I think we're making massive strides forward. But we've also got to consider what the people at home consider is their bills, is their costs... And it all comes in the round, and you've got to do it at a pace where you can clean things up, protect our environment, but you've also got to do it in a way that's responsible for taxpayers and for people at home who have to pick up the tap. Right. Dan, do you agree with that? Well, what I think is that the, the scale of the challenge that we face is almost overwhelming, but at the same time, there are some real economic opportunities. The Yorkshire Post is absolutely right. There is a real opportunity here mm -hmm. to invest in sustainable green technologies sure. that will provide jobs for the future, well-paid jobs. But, do, but do, do we need new licences for oil and gas exploration? <clears throat> well, there's always a balance to be struck ah. in terms of keeping the lights on. But we do need to make sure that at absolute pace we are moving, in the way that other countries are, mm. to invest in technologies and economic opportunities to provide highly skilled jobs in the kind of energies and producing the kind of technologies that undoubtedly we are going to need. Oh. In my own area, there's some extraordinary opportunities. Sure. But we need government actively engaged, working with, uh, with mayors and with local authorities in the private sector and universities to make the most of these opportunities. Look at the energy and the focus in the United States. We need to see more of that here. Well, we'll come on to the levels of investment that Labour is suggesting if you win power in the general election. But, Phoebe, listening to Dan Jarvis there for, for Labour, do you sense any difference in the approach in terms of oil and gas? Can I come back to why I said it's an act of genocide? Because you were talking about economics, you were talking about job opportunities, and I think you're really missing the point, and that is that people are dying as a direct result of the climate crisis. And every day that emissions rise, and they will continue to rise whilst we keep licensing new fossil fuels, more people will die. There is blood on the hands of the Tory party, right. and they oh. know it. All right, well, that's quite a charge. Emily, you wanted to come in, and I'll come to you, Alex, in just a moment. I mean, there's so much to say on this, but... But I would just say, firstly, that we've just been coming out of a gas supply crisis. We've had to import it from some despotic regimes, arguably. Do you want to have be doing that or to be making it here in this country? Second, the Committee of Climate Change have just released a report today talking about the importance of adaptation. The UK alone cannot change the global temperature. That cannot happen. So what we need to do is be adapting to what's happening. We need to adapt to change. That's what the Committee of Climate Change is saying today in its report, and that is just as important as our transition to green energy. We need to be able to adapt. Now, I'm going to come back to you, Phoebe, in a moment. I saw you shaking your head, obviously, at the sound of adaptation. Um, but, Alex, I mean, you were in favour of the Cambo oil field or further exploration of it near Shetland. What do, what do you think when you hear someone like Phoebe speaking about her generation, uh, about the dramatic language she uses in terms of people dying if we don't stop it immediately? Well, I, I, I uh, admire Phoebe's uh, commitment to, to the issue, but I can also say I introduced the first climate change legislation in 2009, which is why Scotland, of course, in terms of its electricity supply, it has more than 100% from renewables right now. And if that was the case in the, the rest of the UK, we'd all be in a better place. But there's so much hot air from the government. I mean, I think every new licence in the North Sea should be attached to a zero carbon commitment, and I also think that's possible. But you see, the carbon capture, the carbon capture should be going ahead at the Acorn plant in, in St Fergus. You know, the, the government's expecting £80,000 million extra from windfall taxes in the North Sea, but they won't put a billion pound into the plant where most of North Sea gas is landed at St Fergus and Aberdeenshire. That's the amount of hypocrisy. And incidentally, it's been going on through Labour governments as well. The Miller project, which would have had Peter Head as a hydrogen station in 2007, was sabotaged by Gordon Brown and well, Alistair Darling. So, you know, this so is hot air on hmm. carbon capture, to coin unless, and, well, hot carbon dioxide in carbon capture, unless you invest where the gas is landed in St Fergus in Aberdeenshire.
Uh, Matt, do you want to respond? I think there's lots of competing priorities for the government, isn't there? We've talked about all the competing priorities on expenditure. Perhaps if 80, Scotland was 80, spending 80, a bit more on its NHS, more. they wouldn't have record 80, waiting lists. Perhaps they were spending billion, more. 80 billion excess oil and gas taxes, and you won't spend a billion pounds on a carbon capture plant. But, but the it's funding the cost of living crisis and helping but, people across this country no, that's pay why their bills. You're gaining 79 billion, bills. 80 billion extra taxes, but you won't invest a billion on carbon capture. Why not? In Scotland, in Scotland, you in won't invest a billion in Scotland, carbon capture. You are You'll spending your money on certain priorities. We're spending it on others. We do not want our NHS waiting list to be through the, through the roof. We do not want our education You're grabbing system to be 80 billion and you won't the spend tables. a billion. All right, Dan, what about, I mean, obviously talking about previous Labour governments too, would you be able to commit to the sorts of levels of investment uh, as in America under Joe Biden's administration? Well, Rachel Reeves, Keir Starmer and Ed Miliband have committed that the next Labour government will invest £28 billion um, in a green uh, industrial plan. I saw for four years as the mayor the difficulties that we have at a regional level in terms of attracting investment. To give you one very practical example, I wanted to transform our bus networks. If we're serious about climate change, we've got to get people out of cars and achieve modal shift. We've just seen the government cut the active travel budget recently, uh, which will mean that fewer people are able to cycle. I wanted to revolutionise our buses. I wanted to decarbonise the, the fleet. Uh, there wasn't any investment that came down from national government to help me do that. So if we're serious about addressing the massive challenges, we need to put our money where our mouth is, and that's why Rachel Reeves has committed £28 billion a year. Right, Phoebe, um, you heard Alex Salmon saying that any new licence or any further exploration of oil and gas should be attached to a commitment to net zero. Would you accept that? Any new licensing of new oil and gas is not a commitment to net zero. And I'd like to come back to what you said about adaptation, because I just I don't understand how you plan to adapt to climate breakdown. There were hundreds of lawyers that signed a letter to say that we will see the breakdown of law and order at 1.5 degrees the, of warming, which is, we're locked in for. When we get to two degrees of warming, they predict that we see one no, billion we know. climate refugees. Just before I came on, I heard that you were talking about the refugee crisis. Mm. How do you plan to adapt to one billion Phoebe, climate right, refugees? Phoebe, Why let, aren't we implementing on, on. the scientific solutions that yes. we have? Hang Why on. aren't we switching to renewables, <laughs> which are nine times cheaper? All Why right. aren't we insulating British homes? Well, Why let's let them on. Answer. Let them answer Why your questions. Why are we taxing big polluters and billionaires? These are no-brainer solutions. All right, Emily, the point first. Is, is that there needs to be an emphasis on adaptation because the UK alone, even if we stopped using oil and gas today, which would lead to people starving and being unable to heat their homes, even if we stopped all, all oil and gas today had no carbon emissions, that would not be enough to affect change across the world and affect the global temperature. We are only responsible for a tiny slither of carbon emissions in the world. So unless you want to stop China from making, uh, from um, uh, building more power plants, unless you want to stop India from doing the same, all of these developing countries. And let's remember, oil and gas is what's put us in this position where we have, where we have life expectancy longer, far longer than it ever used to be, where we are able to build, where we are able to have medicines, we are able to fuel our cars, have transportation, etc., etc. We could obviously still need oil and gas. Phoebe? Well, we could be using renewables. We're, we're, we're an island. We are. Why we're aren't we using tidal Phoebe. power? Why aren't we using tidal power? Matt? We, we've got the biggest offshore wind sector in the... We, we, we're invest, we are leading the way in, in this. We've got one point, we're responsible for 1.5% of the world's emissions. The we UK is definitely leaders. doing its bit. I think oh. you need to talk to the people in China about them doing their bit, and everybody did the bit. We'll be in a much better place. Well, we'll Okay. Now, let me decarbonise in faster than anybody else in the G7. We're doing a damn good job. Uh, Phoebe, and then I'll come to you, Alex. We claim to be global leaders. Why aren't we leading the way in decarbonisation? We're, We're going trying. to have to decarbonise at some point. <laughs> Why aren't we leading the way? Well, let me, we well Phoebe, let me come back today? to Alex. When is the deadline for an end to fossil fuels? Yeah, let me come back, let me come back to Alex. Let me come back to Alex's point, because she rejected, Phoebe, your um, suggestion of making net zero commitments um, alongside any further oil and gas exploration. Well, obviously, I think we should try carbon capture in the saline aquifers of the North Sea. If it's going to work anywhere, it's going to work there. But we should certainly have to do it at St Fergus, because that's where the gas is landed. But can I just point out, we have to incentivise consumption as well. I mean, look, the price of gas and electricity in the UK over the last two years has been based on the international price of gas. But Scotland is 100% self-sufficient renewables. The price of wind hasn't gone up. The price of water hasn't gone up. So why are people 
people being asked to pay electricity bills based on the international price of gas. Emily? No, yes, I know I would agree with that. Right. What about the sorts of changes that people, consumers, taxpayers, households will have to make if we are going to achieve the next stage in terms of net zero? So it could be throwing out your gas boilers. It is about dumping your petrol cars. It, it, are governments being honest about those changes, Emily? Probably not. Um, if you were to completely go net zero and reduce our emissions to zero, um, it would require getting rid of boilers, as you say, not driving cars, not having transportation in the way we currently do, not having industry in the way we currently do, getting rid of all the gas and oil and gas. And let's remember that if we don't if we don't dig it out of the ground here, we're importing it from elsewhere. So that's not exactly cutting our carbon emissions. It would require dramatic change. But I think what is important is that we are seeing massive change in terms of technology. The te technology ah. is getting better and better. We're seeing electric vehicles while they've had their hurdles. They are getting better. Things are moving in the right direction. Direction, but, but too slowly, maybe. Have you not been honest enough? Definitely too slowly. I mean, we had a budget a couple of weeks ago. I don't think there was anything in that budget with regard to home insulation. This is a massive issue. I can't understand why the government don't want well. to invest more resource and effort in properly insulating homes. Good for the environment, but also good for people's pockets during a cost of living crisis. I mean, do you think people in Scotland too are aware of the cost of heat pumps unless you have massive government intervention? Well, that's the point I'm making. I mean, it's cheaper to produce electricity from renewables than it has been for fossil fuels over the last two years. But you've got to incent people have to have the incentive of getting that cheap electricity to heat their homes. And the question is why not? I mean, I'd scrap uh, uh, off gem and, uh, and, and start again in terms of uh, energy regulation because you know, what they're doing is suicidal in terms of that transition. To renewable, renewable energy. Renewables are fantastic, but of course they are intermittent and you do need a base load that will keep our energy system reliable. It could be nuclear, which would be far we're, no, greener. No, no. We, we've got plenty we've got of technology for that. I mean, we're just licensing the greatest pump storage uh, station in Scotland for 50 years. You can match renewables to, to pump storage hydro, you can match it to batteries, you can move to the hydrogen economy. Of course there are ways to do that right. without saying we need to spend you know, countless billions on nuclear power. Phoebe, just before we let you go, what about nuclear power well it's lovely to hear some people on the panel talking some sense if all politicians spoke like that then we wouldn't have to be out on the streets and I hope that it's not just talk it's action because the Tory party have proven that they are just talk last right. summer they were found guilty of not meeting their legally binding net zero agreements yet last year it was me who spent a month in prison I'm not a criminal. I'm a scared kid trying to fight for my future. All right, Phoebe Plummer, thank you for coming on Politics Live. We're going to talk about something completely different. Um, Shelley Phelps, BBC political reporter, has been following the tragic story of 10-year-old Jack Liss, who was killed by a dog near his home in Caerphilly. His mum, Emma, has been in Westminster campaigning uh, for changes in the law and improved safety. Let's have a look. He was kind of typical boy out playing whenever he could be. Mad about cars, wouldn't stop talking about cars. He was just a happy, bright, inquisitive boy. Jack Liss from Caerphilly in South Wales was 10 years old when he was killed. He was attacked by an American bully called Beast while playing with a friend after school. Devastated me and my family. So we never expected this to happen at all and to go from picking him up from school to less than an hour later being told he's gone that is something that stays with me all day every day two people were jailed for owning or being in charge of a dangerously out of control dog but the animal was not on the list of banned breeds now Jack's mother, Emma, has travelled to Westminster to press MPs for changes to the law. Changes around breeding, so not just anyone can breed dogs. Licensing, kind of, then it's selling. So I don't think it's fair that anyone can just sell an animal with no prior knowledge or care for who it's going to. So I think maybe if it's breeders, they've got to sell on specific platforms with their licence number. She says she's determined to do all that she can to prevent more tragedy. Feeling the things that I've been through and seeing what it's done to my family and his friends, 
that's got to stop. We can't let this keep happening. And Shelley Phelps, uh, who reported on that story, joins us now. Shelley, how widespread is this problem of dangerous dogs and attacks? Well, Joe, what the UK government has done is they have set up a working group to, um, which made up of animal experts, um, the police and councils, to look at potential measures to reduce dog attacks and promote responsible ownership. That's going to be making a set of recommendations which are due to be published later this year. Now, there are millions of dogs in the UK and for the most part, you know, they have good relations with uh, people. But a recent BBC investigation found that the number of dog attacks recorded in England and Wales had risen by more than a third in the last five years. Now, um, last year there were nearly 22,000 cases of out-of-control dogs causing injury. That was up from just over 16,000 in 2018. Now, the UK's dog population is estimated to have risen during that time, but only by about 15%. Now, thankfully, cases where there are fatalities are rare, but as we heard from Jack's mum, where that does occur, you know, the effects are utterly devastating. Now, um, that is a rise on recent years. But what the RSPCA says is that if someone is concerned about their dog's behaviour, to get help um, to reduce the risk of their pet going on to bite someone. What about changes in the law? What's the government saying? Well, as I said, the government has set up this working group. Um, that's a mix of animal experts, um, uh, the police and councils, and they're looking at what can be done and how measures could be implemented. And um, MPs are waiting for that group to report. And I think okay. there are MPs from across different political parties who are um, hoping there will be some changes to legislation in this area. Shelley Phelps, thank you very much. Does the law need changing, Amat? Does there need to be more licensing of dog breeders um, in terms of limiting the number of dangerous dog breeds? I think when you see that devastating, heartbreaking story and thoughts go out to the family mm. affected by this, awful. it has to change. We have to do something. I'm glad the government has got this task force together. We're going to look and see what, what comes out of that so that we get the right solution to ensure something like that. Well, we do everything we can to prevent things like that happening. There's a consequence for families who suffer from it. These, there's also an animal welfare issue here in that these animals are not being treated properly and cared for responsibly in that they're getting to this situation where they're behaving like this. We've got to do something for all, all the parties involved in it. Dan? Yes, I completely agree with that. This is beyond heartbreaking, but inspiring that Emma is working to try and improve uh, the law. The working group will report back in due course. We'll look very closely at that. I'm sure we can work on a cross-party basis uh, to make the changes that are required. In general terms, we do support a licensing arrangement for people who breed dogs to trade. I think it's also Im important to say dogs add a huge amount to our lives. You know, I've always had dogs, we'll always have dogs. Mm. But it is really worrying to see an increasing number of attacks. And clearly, the arrangements in place at the moment are not working and they will need toughening up. Let's talk about the NHS, front page of the Daily Express. British public shocking loss of faith in the National Health Service. Uh, public satisfaction in the NHS has slumped to its lowest level ever recorded by the British Social Attitude Survey, with A&E services seeing the biggest year-to-year -year increase in that level of dissatisfaction. Why is that, Matt? I think there are huge challenges first now our NHS. The pandemic was an issue. It stopped elective surgery. We've got an ageing population, which adds to that pressure. We've got a rise in the number of people suffering from mental health issues. Huge pressures on the NHS. Massive pressures on the NHS. But actually, we're doing everything we can. We've put in more money into the NHS than ever before. There are thousands more doctors and thousands... In fact, there are more doctors and nurses working in our NHS than ever before. And we're investing capital as well. In my part of the world, we've got a new diagnostic hospital on the way. We've got a new mental health crisis hub. Um, and yet we've, we've, got, in... we've got backlogs, people waiting uh, for treatment. Seven million, the highest ever. Emily, is money the answer? Well, if you look at what's been put into the NHS since 2010, the budget has increased by 40% in real terms. So the budget is rising, but there is a problem with wages keeping up with that. We know that, you know, NHS staff are out on strike because they don't feel that they're being paid enough for the work they do. And I imagine a lot of them have a very strong case for demanding more money. Um, in terms of the NHS, I think there is a question about reform, whether we could do better than the NHS as a structure. It's not working in Scotland very well. It's not working in Wales very well. It's not working in England very well. What that looks like, of course, is up 
for debate, but I think there does need to be a sense that we can do better, and it's not just about pumping it more with money. There must be structural changes that we can make. Do you agree structural? Structural change is what's actually needed. It's true that on some of the key metrics in Scotland, yeah. um, it's performed the worst on A&E waiting time since last June. Um, what can be done? But, but not, I mean, look, I, I don't think it's enough for the, the Scottish Government to say we're now better than, than England because it's clearly bad. I mean, any waiting times are more than four hours or, or under four hours, rather, which is the target of 70% mm. in Scotland just now. But they were 95%, you know, five years ago. Uh, in England, they're almost 50%. I mean, it's really, really bad. But the, the, in terms of what, what you do, well, one key structural problem is discharging from hospital. I mean, that backs up everything, including the accident and emergency, because people can't get beds. Therefore, people are stuck in ambulances. Therefore, people mm. can't get ambulances. So structural reform? Well, the, the, the social care uh, system, uh, you know, you have to get a solution to that. And the last legislation is going through both <laughs> in England and in Scotland, but the Scottish legislation has stalled. But then, of course, it's quite right to say that, that Brexit Brexit has, uh, has hampered that because of the access to staff in the social care sector. Mm. Uh, so the structural form, social care, primary care is in crisis. Uh, you have to, you have to, I mean, there are some accident emergency units in various parts of the country, take Tayside, for example, which always perform much better than elsewhere. I think one of the things you do is find out why that is and mm. see if the lessons can be applied elsewhere. But also remember, when you look at, you know, just say, oh, we've got more money for the NHS. But the demographics of the population are mm. fundamentally changing. The, the needs of the population well, are they're fundamentally continuing to change, changing. Continue. So the you know, NHS inflation is not the 10% that we're mm -hmm. experiencing across the, the economy. It's 15% or more. And that's what you have to remember when you just say, oh, we're putting extra money in. It's it, not just about money. I mean, a record low. Uh, public attitudes towards the National Health Service, seen as the, a sort of treasure uh, of life in the UK. Why? why? Well, so a record low now, yeah. but a record high when the last Labour government left office in 2010. I think the satisfaction rate was something like 70%. I was in my local hospital last week and basically it's held together by extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, mm. but they are tired worn down, they don't feel that they're properly valued. So it isn't all about money. It'd be easy to say pour more resource into the NHS. It isn't about that. There are some structural issues. We also, I think, need to be investing more in the long-term health and well-being of our population. What more can we do to keep people healthier for longer, to reduce the, the, the pressures on the NHS? Right, well, that's a sort of public health approach which would take yeah. time. To come back to the funding and the money, uh, hearing what others have said on the panel, Matt, the ageing population, the problems in social care, yes, you take on the pandemic, the increases in funding from the government, um, I think are in cash terms, actually, not real terms. Um, and that's just not going to do it, is it, when you look at the backlogs? Even if you look at what it was like pre-pandemic, you're, you're going to have to put in much, much more money to actually wipe away people waiting for treatment. I think it's, it's twofold. It is about putting more money in because we have an immediate problem now, which is requiring us to have more doctors and nurses in our hospitals, which is exactly what we've done. How are, you going to get, how, are you go, how are you going to get How are you going to get more doctors and nurses quickly? We, we are. We are recruiting. We have thousands more people working in our NHS there than ever before. There is a real problem, and, though, on social media, young junior doctors, nurses, posting about their experience of the NHS, why they're going to Australia, why they're going to America, why, they go, why, why they're going to Canada. It does seem like a lot of junior doctors and a lot of nurses can't wait to get out of the NHS, which is pretty disastrous. I think, I mean, one of the big problems, I think, is actually about the social care and the fact that we've got people trapped in hospitals for longer than they should be. Yeah. We saw some investment going into that at the beginning. Uh, I would probably disagree with Dan about the, the political element of it, in that if we go to Wales's NHS and look at what Labour are doing to the NHS in that country, waiting lists are ridiculous. The number of people waiting more than two years, two years for an operation is ridiculous. We're making huge progress on those waiting lists. We've seen the number of people waiting two years massively reduced. We've got hurdles in the way, but we are, we are making massive progress. Well, I haven't seen the figures and whether you're making massive progress, but Dan, do you want to respond about whether uh, Labour could be doing far more in Wales? They're, they're not performing any better. In fact, they're performing worse on some of the key metrics in terms of the National 500 Health Service. times more likely to wait two years for an operation. It feels like a bit of a diversionary tactic to be talking about the NHS in Wales. Let's look at our public services in the round. Nothing 
is working in the way that it should. I don't know whether Matt could name a single public service that he could say hand on heart is working in the way that it should. The Prime Minister couldn't when he was asked about it. The reality is we've had 13 years of Conservative government. Our NHS doesn't have the investment or support it needs and neither do any of our other public services. Right. I mean, if there isn't going to be radical change, is there going to be longer waiting lists, people having to sit in A&E for more hours than they are currently now? Well, it seems like the trajectory is, is that way. Um, it's pretty shocking that it's not just even A&E, it's surgeries, basic appointments, difficulties getting GP appointments, dentistry is not being able to take on new clients. It really is very difficult to get basic health care at this point. I think probably all of us have sat on the phone to a GP um, while we wait to see if we'll get an appointment sometime, somewhere. And we see a massive increase in the number of people who are choosing to spend their savings, dig deep into their pockets mm. to go privately because that's how they can get an appointment quickly and efficiently. Would Albert do anything radically differently to the SNP? Well, I, th I think two things. One is to, I think it would help if all politicians actually across the parties made a fundam fundamental restatement of commitment to National Health Service. Oh. Free at the point of need because there is oh. doubt and question marks about uh, various parties' commitment to the, to the principle of the health service. And secondly, I think we should all agree to start talking about health service investment, not in nominal terms or even in real terms of the rest of the economy, but in health service terms. Because once you understand the dynamic of what's pushing health service inflation, mm. then you can match that with expenditure. Well, do you agree with Alex Salmon that there's some doubt about the commitment to the founding principles of the NHS, free at the point of use? We hear this ridiculous story from the Labour Party every general election. My party is committed to the NHS. That is why we're putting more money in than ever before. That is why we're employing more doctors and nurses than ever before. That is why in my local part of the world, I want a new hospital. But I've got a new diagnostic hospital. I've got a new mental health hub. Oh. We are getting real investment, well, a series just, of diagnostic just, hospitals. And the 40 new hospitals promised by Boris Johnson. It's Wes Streeting, who was... Who's the Shadow Health Secretary. Shadow Health Secretary talking about the potential for reform. So perhaps that's the way we're going. Dan? Yeah. No organisation, um, well, all organisations require some sort of sense of reform, and the NHS is, is no different. But we're 13 years in. Matter mm -hmm. the Conservatives, they have to take some responsibility well. for the state of the NHS. This is a cherished national institution, but the satisfaction levels demonstrate that most people's experience, despite the fact that they value the people who work in it, is not where it needs to be. That's not good enough and the government must to do, must to do much more. Um, do you accept that many of these problems were here before the pandemic, exacerbated by the I pandemic, of huge, course? There are huge challenges on the NHS. From the point at which the NHS was conceived, when it came into being, we now have a much older population, we have increases in mental health, as I said, all these other big pressures on the NHS. But actually in the UK, waiting times are coming down, not in Labour's Welsh NHS, but in the UK, waiting times are coming down. We've got a hell of a lot more to do, but the incredible workforce at my local hospital is doing a damn good job. Right. I mean, it, when it comes to recommitting to the founding principles of the NHS, does that preclude discussions about radical reform, about things that would perhaps change it, still keeping those founding principles? No, no it doesn't. And the National Care Service is an example of that. You can have a, a National Care Service within the principles of a, a National Health Service. But, you see, why it's important is this, that the, the NHS can only exist under the strain it's under because mm. of the commitment of people who work yeah. in it. These people have to know that the political uh, parties and establishment are behind them. They have to know that they support the principles, are not undermining that principle. That's why it's important to restate that belief. Let's welcome viewers from the BBC News Channel. You're watching Politics Live. We have just over five minutes until Prime Minister's questions with the deputy leaders, uh, Dominic Raab for the government and Angela Rayner for Labour. Um, something that happened in the last hour or so was the new First Minister of Scotland, uh, Hamza Yousaf, uh, being sworn in today. We can show you the pictures here of what actually happened at the court of session in Edinburgh. Um, Alex Salmond, you were the first SNP, first minister uh, of Scotland. Do you have faith that this one, Hamza Yousaf, will achieve what you and Nicola Sturgeon failed to do, which is independence for Scotland? Well, well first of all, let's congratulate uh, Hamza on getting sworn in. We have, I mean, yeah. That happened to me twice, and he was much better dressed than I was uh, when, uh, <laughs> when, I, when I was swearing in. So let's congratulate Hamza to, today. In terms of getting to independence, I hope so. Uh, I mean, one, one thing should be said, because I know that a lot of London commentators are crowing about how independence is on the, on the way and all the rest of it. 
You know, when I kicked off the independence campaign for the referendum in 2014, mm. support for independence was below 30%. Mm. Even now, after slipping a bit... It's, it's broadly 40, been... It, well, it's broadly 50-50, isn't yeah, it? I mean, it's down a little making. bit. Yes. And, and furthermore, you've also got a situation back in 2012, mm. uh, support for the SNP was far higher than support for independence. Now you've got the reverse. Support for independence is actually higher than the SNP's rating. So the lesson for that for Hamza is this. Do not listen to the siding voices that say soft pedal independence. Ah. Do the reverse. Do you think that's front and centre? Do you think there's a risk of that, that he is going to soft pedal independence? Because I watched all the debates, and certainly from his perspective, it seemed that he wants to build, he says, on uh, the record of the SNP, which is obviously we've debated at large, rather than pushing uh, ahead with independence. Well, let's see what he actually does. But if he did that, as you've interpreted it, that would be a mistake. He's going into a, a general election next year, a UK election, where you have to have a unique selling point. Okay. And in a situation where support for independence is higher than support for the SNP, it would be madness to soft pedal independence. What do you mean, soft pedal? What's the alternative? What's your radical alternative? Well, I, I thought the, the best concept, now that you know the referendum strategy, which I devised for the for the SNP, has mm. been driven up a cul-de-sac, uh, why I don't mm. know, but certainly that's where it is, then I, I thought that Ash Reagan actually put forward ah. the best policy, which is to say, go back to where we were before that and say, look, if we're not going to get a referendum, if you're not going to get permission from the, the powers that mm. are down here... Which are not. ..each and every national election... Mm. If there's a majority of votes in favour of independence, uh, it's a it should be taken as a mandate to negotiate Scottish independence. It doesn't sound like Hamza Yousaf is going to do that. I mean, well, I know you and Nicola Sturgeon fell out spectacularly, mm -hmm. but she is credited uh, with being extremely successful as a politician, winning eight elections in a row. Has her departure set back the cause of independence? Well, you know, I won lots of elections uh, as well, but I didn't get independence. See, a national party leader is judged not the number of elections you win. On that basis, ah. we're very successful. A national party leader is judged on whether you get Scotland to independence. And so has a her... hard taskmaster, but that is the task that Hamza has. Right. Well, you both failed, you could say, in that task. Yeah, well, you, well, you I'm, have. I'm, but I'm, has I'm her... Not, has... I know you want to keep repeating that. I'm not disputing it. No, but, I don't repeat it. But, but you know, all, all, things, all things are relative. We've gone from yeah. the SNP no, I and, take and that. independence being a minority pursuit, a romantic Absolute, And now it's mainstream. ...to yeah. being a, a mainstream and a very so has immediate Nicholas, perspective. Has so this is the last time that you would start to backpedal on that commitment. Has her departure, though, Nicola Sturgeon's departure, bearing in mind she has been so successful, set back that cause well, of independence? No, I, mean, I think Nicola, by her resignation, indicated she'd run out of road. She'd gone down the wrong, the wrong route and therefore somebody else has the opportunity to take a different strategy. Look, But he's not, going, he's not going to... He's well, we seen as continuity Nicola yeah, well, Sturgeon. That's that. what I'm trying to get to. Well, is well, that, yeah. people, people say lots of things in leadership campaigns and they often do very different things. I think, you know, continuity in the SNP right now <laughs> would be Einstein's theory of madness. You know, the idea if you keep doing the same thing, you'll get a different result. They have to do something different. My <laughs> advice, I mean, Hamza may not want my advice, but my advice to him is get independence front and centre of his campaigning, look at that 47% that's now who believe in independence and translate that into votes for independence at the ballot box. You mentioned Ash Regan. Um, mm. Kate Forbes, um, former finance mm. uh, secretary, uh, has turned down a job mm. um, offered by Hamza Yousaf. Would you welcome her into Alba? Well, yes, of course, but I mean, that doesn't mean she's about to join Alba. I think, mm. you know, it's a, it's a you know, at least early days, but it's a big misstep. When you win an election by 52% to 48%, when your two rival candidates got more votes than you did, the very first thing you do as a leader is get them into your tent. You don't, you know, offer them a demotion and then wonder why they turn it down. And that, that's a, an early and fairly substantial mistake by him. Are you talking to Kate Forbes and perhaps Ash Regan? Uh, well, I've, I've answered this question. I, I, I've spoken at various times in my life to mm. all three of the, of the course, candidates. Of course, but of recently course, since the contest... If, 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 you know, if, if Hamza picks up the phone, and I'm not saying he will, as long as he doesn't phone reverse charges, then I'll give him, I'll give him free <laughs> advice. I, you I mean, heard it I, here I, first, Hamza Yusuf. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he may not want to do that. That's, that's up to him. But, you know, we're in a public forum just now. The logic position, I would say, for people who believe in independence is to make sure that's front and centre of every election campaign. Your response, Matt Vickers? Um, I mean, the government has always made it clear, as has Labour, they would turn down any repeated request uh, to hold another independence referendum. I think it is guttering, devastating, disappointing, absolutely guttering that 
Hamza picks up the phone to Rishi and his priority is about independence. The people across this country face massive challenges. In Scotland, highest drug deaths in Europe, education system falling down the league tables, NHS waiting list through the roof, and they're talking about independence. They actually, I hope, I congratulate Hamza, I hope he will work with the UK government to deliver on the priorities that people out there want, on, on halving inflation, on, on cutting the debt, on growing the economy, on stopping the boats and reducing those NHS uh, wellness. I, I hope you'll get why behind Why can't them. you do both things? Back in 2014, nobody, not even the fiercest opponent the first of independence... No, listen to the point before you answer it. Not even the fiercest opponent of independence in 2014 argued that the Scottish Government governed anything other than competently. It's that reputation for competence that's been lost over the last two or three years. You can argue for independence and run the country wisely and well. Tell the Scottish person who is sat on an NHS waiting list, whose kids are at a failing school, who is struggling to pay the bills and meet the cost of living. Inspired, be inspired, inspired, inspired by the, first, the example of Westminster. The first thing to follow Hamza's mouth is independence. You've got a Prime Minister every two minutes. Well, let him it would be madness for him to continue on with the gender reform stuff. Yes, indeed. Uh, absolutely. I mean, see, Nicola Sturgeon's ran into problems not because she mm. over-prioritised independence, she, she went down the wrong route in that, but because she got entranced in self-identification, you know, in the phrase that's been used recently, concentrating self-determination for the country, not self-identification, which is a fraught issue that no society in, in Western Europe has managed to adequately deal with. Would you, would Alaba ever consider rejoining or merging with the SNP? Well, it depends what you mean. Through an independence convention, I mean, which is a, a, a concept which has been widely canvassed, which would allow all of the independence parties and even more importantly, the grassroots pressure groups, the think tanks, to mm. get back together in the campaign. Now, if the offer came for that, the answer would be yes from uh, Oliver. Labour see this as a, an opportunity, yeah. uh, the departure of Nicola Sturgeon. We've yet to see, of course, what Hamza Youssef uh, does as First Minister. But you do still have to persuade uh, nearly half the population who want independence, it is down a little bit, that they should vote for Unionist Party. Well, look, as a proud advocate for devolution, I wish him well, but I hope that he will focus a bit less on the politics of grievance and a bit more on the politics of unity, bringing people together, because ultimately, as a country, I passionately believe that we are better together. I think Prime Minister's Questions is about to start. Let's go into the chamber. We can see uh, Dame Eleanor Lang there uh, adjudicating proceedings, but I think we'll be about to start. Um, let's just dip in and hear what she is talking about, otherwise we'll come back into the studio. Minister Sir Bill Wigan. Yeah. Question number one. Well, Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I've been asked to reply on behalf of my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, who is attending the funeral of Baroness Betty Boothroyd. I'm sure the whole House would want to join me in paying tribute to Baroness Boothroyd, the first female Speaker of the House, and our thoughts and prayers are with her family. Yeah. I'm sure the whole House does join in sending our thoughts and prayers about Baroness Boothroyd, yeah. whom we all held in very high esteem. Yeah. So, Thank Bill Wigan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Phosphates leaching into the River Wye could be stopped <coughs> by proven phosphate stripping technology attached to anaerobic digesters. Yeah. But Herefordshire Council's bypass hating green and independent group oh. won't support oh. or engage despite a moratorium on house building. What can he do to save our river and remove the council from such a vital, strategic and environmental responsibility? Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The River Wye obviously is of huge importance to nature. Uh, we're taking action to tackle pollution and raise farming standards. He'll know about the Environment Agency's uh, farm inspection capacity and catchment sensitive farming advice programme. Uh, and I defer to his technical knowledge in this area. Uh, I'm sure he'll want to make submissions to the local authority. Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Angela Rayner. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and welcome back into the chair. And can I share the Deputy Prime Minister's words on our Baroness and our thoughts with her family today? And I'm sure the whole House will join me also in paying tribute to Paul O'Grady after his sad death was announced today. He was a national treasure and a true Northern star, and he will be greatly missed. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, this week the Government announced their so-called anti-social behaviour policy. It's only taken 13 years. And look, I'll give him some credit. The Deputy Prime Minister knows firsthand the misery caused by thugs and their intimidating behaviour. <laughs> Lurking with menace, exploding in fits of rage, creating a culture of fear, and maybe even, I don't know, throwing things. So, can I ask him, under his new anti social behaviour, does he think more bullies will be brought to justice? <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, I can reassure the House I've never called anyone scum. Honourable Lady is serious about standing up for communities and people who suffer at the scourge of antisocial behaviour should back our plan to deal more swiftly uh, with these issues, to make sure that we ban drugs beyond the conventional ones, give police the powers they need, and if they really, if they really want to protect the public, they will back our plans for parole reform to make sure the murderers, the terrorists, the child killers are not allowed out free to, to threaten other people and reintroduce the ministerial veto that that side took away. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to see the ministerial code being introduced yep. under day two on that side of the House, because it's not just his department where antisocial behaviour is running out of control. It's happening across the country. Police officers disappearing from our streets, replaced by criminals, plaguing our towns and leaving people feeling unsafe. The truth is that the Conservatives are missing in action in the fight against crime. So can he tell his constituents and the public why, after 13 years of his party in government, there are now 6,000 fewer neighbourhood police officers on Britain's streets? Ma Madam Deputy Speaker, she really does have a brass neck because they voted against our funding of police recruitment <laughs> and the 20,000 extra police officers. But what I will tell her and the whole House is crime is lower than it was under the last Labour government. Violent crime is halved. Reoffending is seven percentage points lower. And if she really wants to stand up for the public and the victims of crime, they should back our bill to protect victims and protect the most vulnerable from serious, killer, serious killers, rapists and terrorists. Yeah. Mr Speaker, no one believes that there's more police on the streets and no one feels safer. Neighbourhood policing has gone down and not up. Let's talk about crime. He knows, as well as I do, that neighbourhood police can help prevent antisocial behaviour and knife crime. But trusted local police are also crucial to protecting women. Women feel unsafe on Britain's streets, always looking over our shoulder as we hurry to our front door. So can he tell me, under his watch as Justice Secretary, what is the charge rate for rape? Yeah. Can I address all of those elements of that? And first of all, say that the issue of rape and serious sexual violence against women is one of our top priorities. Oh. It, it, she, asked, she asked what we're doing about it. Since 2019, police referrals of cases are doubled, CPS charges have doubled. She asked, she asked on my watch what has happened. The volume of convictions in rape cases increased by two thirds. And if she really wants to protect vulnerable women, whether it's rapists uh, or from rapists or other serious crimes, they will back our parole reforms, which will mean ministers able to prevent uh, them being released onto the public and cause more threats. Angela Rayner. He says that rape conviction has gone up. What he really means is that 300 women will be raped today while he boasts about an increase of 0.5 per cent. He hasn't answered my question, Madam Deputy Speaker, because he's too ashamed of the answer. 1.6% of rapists face being charged for their crime. 1.6%. Let that sink in. A woman goes through the worst experience of her life. She summons up the courage to relive that horrendous experience, to tell the police in detail about her assault. But she only has 
a 1.6% chance of action being taken. Over 98% of rapists will never see the inside of a courtroom, let alone a prison. And the rest of those brave women, Madam Deputy Speaker, they keep looking over their shoulders and hope the perpetrator doesn't choose tonight to take their revenge for reporting the incident to the police. In the last 13 years of the Tory government, more than half a million cases of rape have been recorded by the police. But the charge rate for those attacks have collapsed. He has served under five Tory Prime Ministers and had three years as Justice Minister. And on his watch, rapists are left to roam the streets. So will he apologise to those victims who will never get justice because of his failures? Yeah. I'll first of all say to the Right Honourable Lady, the conviction rate measured by the CPS, the leader of the Labour Party used to be in charge of the CPS, he might want to point this out, well actually the, the, the conviction rate has gone up, it is now at 69%. We are doing much more to support the victims of rape when they come forward. Well, they're talking a good game. In fact, we have quadrupled funding for victims since 2010. And if she looks at the latest data, the time it's taken from charge to completion of a rape case has come down by, come, come down by 10 weeks or 70% in the last three months alone. She should get her facts straight, particularly when talking about such a sensitive issue. Madam Deputy Speaker, he won't apologise for the government failures on charge rates and 69% of 1.6%. Is that really something to boast about? Let me ask him about an issue which is directly his responsibility. On his watch, rape survivors are waiting on average more than three years for their cases to come to court. The Honourable Member talked about 10-week ten ten reduction. Three years, Deputy. Uh, deputy Leader, three years, so ten weeks is not anything to boast about. Exactly. The, those three years from the day of the assault to the final day of court, is it any wonder that from April till September last year, 175 trials for rape and other serious sexual offences have had to be dropped because the victim could no longer cope with the delay? Yeah. So let me ask him, when will he apologise to all those women denied justice because of his failure to keep to sort the court backlog? Yeah. Well, she ignores the impact on the court backlog of the pandemic, or indeed the CBA strike. But let me tell her what we're doing. Let me tell her what we're doing. We've quadrupled funding for victims since 2010, quadrupled the funding provided by the last Labour government. We launched the 24-7 support line so that when those victims of that appalling crime come forward, they get the support they need. We've increased the number of independent sexual violence advisers uh, to over 1,000, uh, and we're making sure that women uh, uh, that suffer this appalling crime can give pre-recorded uh, evidence in court. We're doing everything that we can, and as I said, uh, the, the rates are coming down. Uh, and we will keep uh, uh, taking action in Syria. If she really, if the Labour Party were really serious about this, they wouldn't have voted against longer sentences for dangerous, violent and sexual offenders in the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act, and she would get behind our Victims and Prisoner Bill today. Madam Deputy Speaker, not a word of apology, no sense of responsibility and not even a shred of shame. The reality is, while people in Britain feel more and more unsafe, he seems to spend all of his time trying to save his own job and none of his time on his actual job. And it's not just me that thinks so. The Prime Minister clearly doesn't trust him to deal with antisocial behaviour because he's given that job to the levelling up secretary. <laughs> the way things are going, and reports are to be believed, this might be your last PMQs. So let's look at the highlights. A criminal justice on its knees. The largest court backlog on record. Rape victims waiting for justice. And through it all, he managed to rack up 24 formal complaints from his own civil servants. So can he say today, will he walk before he's pushed? Madam Deputy Speaker, one thing never changes. She always comes with the usual bluster and political opportunism. Let me, let me tell, let me tell the right honourable lady what we've been doing, what I've been doing this week. 
We have delivered new legislation to support the victims of crime, including rape, and to protect the public. We have delivered a plan to stamp out antisocial behaviour, and we have supported families with their energy bills. What has she done? What have the Labour front bench done? They tried to block our small boats bill, and that is the difference between them and us. We deliver for Britain. She likes to play her political games. Deputy Speaker, and it is wonderful to see you in your place. As my right honourable friend will be aware, uh, the Thames Freeport was recently given the final go ahead to become fully operational, creating thousands of jobs and attracting millions in inward investment. Will my right honourable friend join me in congratulating the team behind the bid and encourage businesses and investors from across the South East, indeed across the world? to take a closer look at the fantastic opportunities that exist in Thurrock and will he work with local education providers to ensure my constituents have the skills needed to take up these fantastic opportunities? Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I thank my hon. Friend. Uh, I certainly do uh, support and pay tribute to all of those who have made the new Thames Freeport uh, possible with its uh, potential to deliver over 12,000 new jobs. Uh, I look forward to seeing the local community and the wider communities benefit from the tax benefits, the custom zones, and we will see how these plans progress. Uh, and again, uh, I think it is good news to see the communities in Basildon and Thurrock taking full advantage of the Brexit opportunities. The Deputy Leader of the SNP, Murray Black. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I also wish to send my warm regards to the family of Paul O'Grady, the legendary drag queen, for all he's done for my community. I also want to congratulate Hamza Youssef as he becomes yeah. first minister of Scotland. As the, as the first Scots Asian and Muslim to hold such an office, I'm sure the whole House will send his warm regards. Now, in recent days, video footage has emerged of the former Chancellor and the former Chair of the 1922 Committee offering their services for £60,000 on top of their MP's salary. The former Health Secretary offered his wisdom for £10,000 a day. Going once. Can I ask the Deputy Prime Minister, when he is inevitably booted out of office, what will his going rate be? Ah. <laughs> well, can I... Can I welcome her to uh, uh, the, the chamber? Uh, the, system of, the system of declarations is there to ensure transparency and accountability. And of course, the Conservatives backed tightening up those rules uh, to make sure that there couldn't be any lobbying. Uh, but can I also join with, uh, uh, except to take her up on her uh, tribute to the, first, uh, the new First Minister of Scotland. The Prime Minister spoke to him last night. Uh, we welcome him to his place. And of course, the government will want to work constructively with him in the best interest of the people of Scotland. Murray Black. During a cost of living crisis, as his colleagues eye up barrels of cash from fake companies, yep. <laughs> it's the people across these aisles that are being led by donkeys and yeah. they're sitting on the now, the former Health Secretary also said that he would impart his wisdom for £1,500 an hour. Most nurses earn little above £15 an hour. Who does the Deputy Prime Minister think is best value for money and for the public? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm delighted that the majority of the health unions have accepted uh, the pay settlement. We, we, we think that that's absolutely, uh, we think that that's absolutely right. And she, she raises the issue. Uh, and of course, we've uh, we've uh, worked with on a cross-party basis to curb the limits on second earnings. I, I, I notice the benches on this side are, are, are curiously quiet. Is that because? There's ten shadow cabinet members on their benches uh, who are taking earnings. In particular, the shadow foreign secretary looks like he, he certainly doesn't want to be uh, under the limelight. <laughs> He's got earned second earnings from 40 different sources. I, I don't think uh, uh, they can talk about it. And uh, as far as the honourable lady is concerned, we've done everything we can to make sure there's transparency and accountability. Jack Burton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's very good to see you back in this place. Uh, Stoke-on-Trent has been announced 
as one of the levelling up partnerships. And this is on top of the investment we've already received through programmes like the Levelling Up Fund. And this has been delivered thanks to Conservatives working together in government and on the City Council, led by the formidable councillor Abby Brown. So would my right and more friend agree with me if people want to continue to see the levelling up of opportunities in Stoke-on-Trent, they should vote Conservative in the local elections in May. Well, uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and after years of neglect under Labour, it's now the Conservatives, in no small part thanks to my honourable friend, who have been levelling up in Stoke-on-Trent, £11 million from the Shared Prosperity Fund, £12 million from the Levelling Up Fund, £4 million from the Regional Growth Fund, and that's supporting over 500 jobs and £28 million of private investment. That's the difference for the people of Stoke under a Conservative government. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yesterday, the Secretary of State uh, told uh, us that the uh, security service, MI5, have increased the terrorism threat level in Northern Ireland to severe. Responsibility for dealing with terrorism and national security rests with the Government of the United Kingdom, including in Northern Ireland. Will the Deputy Prime Minister assure me and the people of Northern Ireland that the Government will provide the Police Service of Northern Ireland and the Security Service with the resources that they need to counter this serious terrorist threat? Deputy Prime Minister. Can I thank uh, uh, the Honourable Gentleman? He's absolutely right. Of course, the threat level is kept under constant review. We take into account a range of factors. He'll be very familiar with those. It's disappointing uh, that the threat level has gone up, but I think it is worth also saying that it has been in significant decline in terms of the number of uh, uh, Northern Ireland-related terrorist attacks and attempted attacks since the peak of the violence in 2009-2010. Nonetheless, of course, we will make sure all the resources available to the PSNI and the public are reminded to remain vigilant and report any suspicious behaviour activity. James Grundy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In my recent local survey as to whether Lee should break away from Wigan Council, I am very pleased to say that so far the survey shows 90% in favour, with only 3% opposed. Please, I mean, before you call for a second referendum, let me finish the question. Does my right honourable friend agree that in the 50th year of our campaign for our town's independence, that this is the year to get Lexit done? Yeah! My honourable friend campaigns uh, with typical gusto. Um, I think he knows that changing the boundaries at local authority level uh, is subject to an independent process, but I will ensure he gets a meeting with the Minister for Local Government so he can uh, further discuss the aspirations for Lake. Cat Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Despite Royal Mail posting record profits, management are threatening to put it into administration. Uh, Can I ask what conversations government is having with Royal Mail and what it's doing to protect the Universal Postal Service? Deputy Prime Minister. It's an incredibly difficult time. Can I thank her for a question? Obviously, the pandemic has had a particular uh, impact, um, but we're working very closely uh, to make sure we can continue um, the service. And I'll make sure she gets a meeting with the relevant minister to discuss her concerns further. Mark Eastwood. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the people of Dewsbury, I would also like to pay tribute to Dewsbury's greatest daughter, Betty Boothrug. She was sorely missed. This week I visited Ravenhall School in Dewsbury and Hollybank School in Murfield. Both do amazing work teaching children with special educational needs and disabilities. However, there is disparity in SEND standards in mainstream schools within my constituency. Would my right honourable friend join me in thanking the teachers and staff at Ravenshall and Holly Bank for everything they do? And could he also outline how we can ensure all our children are given the best chance in life, regardless of which school they go to? Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. 
And I thank uh, my honourable friend and pay tribute to the teachers and the staff at both schools, Ravens Hall and Hollybank, for the amazing work they do. It's a very difficult and challenging job, uh, and incredibly important for the life chances of those uh, children affected. He'll know that in March we published the Send an Alternative Provision Improvement Plan with new national standards, and that's backed up by uh, an increased specialist provision locally uh, with £2.6 billion going into it, and uh, that includes opening 33 new special schools with a further 49 in the pipeline. Douglas Chapp. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, while the Prime Minister is absent, I hope he later gets a chance to watch the BBC dramatisation uh, the Brinks Mart robbery, which was uh, held in the, the 1980s, where the police team assigned to the recovery of this gold only got back half of the gold that was stolen. That sum pales into in insignificance compared with the measly 1% from the £1 billion of business grants that the, uh, was lost uh, to the fraud issued by, by the Prime Minister under his watch when he was Chancellor. The fingerprints show that this massive fraud now lies at 10 Downing Street. To quote your former fraud minister, Lord Bilton, when will this government, when will this government get its act together and step up the recovery efforts on behalf of the taxpayer? Yeah. Yeah. Prime minister. Well, the, the, the instance of fraud has become much more complex with the online instance, but he will have noted the massive increase in funding for tackling fraud in the recent budget, and we're confident that will give us the resources we need to tackle uh, this uh, often invisible but very damaging crime. Sir Robert Neil. The Deputy Prime Minister will know that stroke is the greatest cause of adult disability in this country and costs uh, our economy some £26 billion, never mind destroying lives. Last year I met Dr John Stevens, who was unable even to sit up unaided after a stroke, but because of emergency thrombectomy procedure is now back at work as a GP in the NHS. Yeah. Sadly, only 30% of eligible patients actually get thrombectomies. Will the, Prime, the Deputy Prime Minister agree that we need greatly to increase the rollout of thrombectomy procedures? And would he perhaps, in the run-up to World Thrombectomy Day next month, join me in visiting uh, a thrombectomy centre to see at first hand the difference it can make to lives and to getting people back into meaningful and uh, productive work uh, <coughs> and enjoyment? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, can I thank my uh, honourable friend? I, he's been a dedicated champion for stroke survivors. I know from my own constituency how debilitating that can be uh, and the impact it has on the wider families. NHS England are committed to increasing the delivery of mechanical thrombectomy, uh, including uh, the expansion of uh, local services and local capital investment. And I'm sure we can arrange for uh, a health minister to join him on a visit as he requests. Sarah Olney. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. In a shocking article in Surrey Live last year, it was reported that staff at a GP practice in Walton were left in tears and crumbling under pressure due to the increased workload caused by staff shortages. Is it any wonder when there are 850 fewer GPs across the country since 2019? So what does the Deputy Prime Minister say to those patients left in pain and staff left in tears, including in his own constituency, due to this government's failed promise to recruit more GPs? Yeah. Well, can I say to her, any abuse against any GP in any practice uh, across the country is absolutely wrong. We have to have zero tolerance uh, of it. What I would just say to her is we've seen a, a large increase in GP appointments, over 29 million carried out since the start of the year. We're improving access to general practice with more support staff, also the technology, so more state-of-the-art telephone systems. The number of GPs in training is at record levels, and we're investing £1.5 billion to create 50 million more appointments a year by 2024. If we go a bit faster, we'll get everybody in. Scott Benton. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, since 2019, this government has provided well over £300 million in extra funding for projects in Blackpool. Yeah. However, there is always room for more. The Bond Street and Revo areas of my constituency are among the most deprived in the country and have been long forgotten by the Labour-led yeah. council. Yeah. The government has already provided £600,000 in funding for a feasibility project with a view to delivering a £30 million regeneration package for these areas. Will the government look closely at the business case to see how this transformational project can be delivered for those communities? Yeah. 
order, before the Deputy Prime Minister answers that, can everyone else with a prepared question just cut it in half? Just do the question. Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There is no one more tenacious in campaigning for Blackpool than the Honourable Gentleman. I have seen it firsthand when I visited with him. Uh, I am pleased that we delivered, with the Levelling Up Secretary, the £40 million of funding to relocate the Magistrates Court uh, and to allow um, the County Court complex to move. Uh, and I know that the Levelling Up Secretary will want to work with him on the regeneration aspirations for the future. Wendy yeah. Chamberlain. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. A little girl in my constituency, only nine years old, developed a bacterial infection just before Christmas, but thereafter very distressing symptoms occurred. OCD, she has uh, intrusive thoughts, she hasn't washed, dressed or properly eaten since Christmas. We believe this to be Pan's Panda, and although health has evolved and I am seeking support for her, part of the lottery and the antipsychotic medication that is often um, given in this condition, despite the fact that broad-based antibiotics have been proven to work, is because the UK, no part of the UK, has implemented World Health Organisation ICD-11. Will the government commit to looking at this so that other children across the UK don't need to suffer in such a way? Yeah. Can, I, can I thank the Honourable Lady for raising what seems like a, a very uh, an awful case, and my heart goes out to the family involved. If she'd like to write with me about it, I'll make sure she gets uh, a full answer and a, a meeting with the Minister if that's required. Caroline Mooks. Yeah. 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 Speaker. Georgia Harrison is an incredibly brave young woman yeah. who only got justice when she was a victim of revenge porn because she could prove that the perpetrator intended to cause her distress. Most victims can't, and perpetrators are using platforms to use revenge porn for financial gain. That's not covered in the legislation. Will my right honourable friend commit to looking at the case studies Georgia has compiled and reviewing this legislation to strengthen it and make it more effective? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I thank the uh, uh, honourable lady, my honourable friend, my right honourable friend, for all that she's done in this area? I know that there have been considerable number of changes to the online safety bill, not least because of her forensic attention to detail. They will include the creation of a new base offence of sharing intimate images without consent that don't require. Uh, proof of an intention to cause distress. Um, and of course, the government also supports the revenge porn helpline, which offers free and confidential advice. If there are any further changes that she thinks need to be made, very happy to look at them with her. Sir Chris Bryant. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I don't know whether the Deputy Prime Minister ever met Lily Savage um, or has ever spent a night out at the Royal Vauxhall Tavern. But Lily was. I can take him sometime if he wants to go. Um, the, um, I say yes. But the, I think that was a yes, actually. Yeah. But, the, um, but Lily was performing at the height of the AIDS crisis in 1987, um, when police officers raided the pub, arrested her, amongst others. Um, they were wearing rubber gloves because supposedly they were protecting themselves from contracting HIV from touching gay men. Lily amazingly said at the time, um, "Oh." Lads, you've come to do the washing up. That's great. Um, her alter ego, Paul O'Grady, campaigned acerbically and hilariously for elderly people, for care workers, um, against oppression of every kind. Isn't it time we in this country celebrated our naughty, hilarious drag queens and comics yeah. of every kind who inspire us to be a better and more generous nation? Yeah. Yeah. Can I thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman? I totally agree with him. And uh, Paul Grayson was an uh, incredible comic, but he also. <laughs> but, but Lily. But, Paul O'Grady. But, but in terms of Lily Sadge, also, I think some of that comedy broke glass ceilings and broke uh, boundaries in a way that certainly politicians would struggle to do. So I agree with that. I also think it shows how we need uh, greater, more rambunctious free speech, and we need to avoid the wokery and the limitations on comedy, which I'm afraid both of them would have had no time for. Dame Caroline Dynage. Very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to associate myself with the words of the Honourable Gentleman from Rhonda. Paul O'Grady was a great champion for animal welfare as well. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the biggest cause of death for children in this country under the age of 14 is cancer. As she knows, I've been calling for a childhood cancer mission to radically change how we detect, how we treat, and how we care for children with cancer. Everything from genome science for detection, right the way through to seven-day-a-week play facilities in children's ward. The 
the Health Secretary has been brilliant. He's met with me and has been really positive on this. But will the Deputy Prime Minister uh, restate the government's support for a childhood cancer mission? Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Can I thank uh, my honourable friend? I certainly will. And, and uh, the suffering that any child uh, must go through when they get a condition like cancer at such an early age, difficult to believe, and the pressure on the families, uh, incredible. So I, I thank her for her work. The DHSC will publish a major condition strategy to look at improving outcomes and experience for all cancer patients, but including in particular uh, children. Uh, I can't preempt uh, that, but I know it will draw on previous work, including submissions from the various childhood cancer charities. And again, I pay tribute to the work that they do. Stephanie Peacock. Thank you, Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker. Yeah. My six-year-old constituent, Daniel, has cerebral palsy and mitochondrial disease. He has received palliative care from the Blue Bellwood Children's Hospital, who were forced to temporarily close last year due to staffing pressures. They have ongoing concerns about rising bills. Will the Deputy Prime Minister reassure Daniel's family that he will receive the palliative care he requires as and when he needs it? Yeah. 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 Prime Can I thank her for raising that uh, very important case uh, that she does? Uh, I don't know all the facts of it, but if she writes to me, I'm very happy to look at it. We will make sure um, the resourcing, but also the care uh, is there. And if, again, as I say, if she writes to me, I'm, I'm sure we can arrange for a meeting with the relevant minister. Wendy Morton. Madam Deputy Speaker, oh, the inclusion yeah. of the West Midlands as a hotspot trailblazer police force area in the social and social um, behaviour action plan is really good news. Could my right honourable friend outline though how communities such as those in my constituency on the periphery of the West Midlands will see and feel the positive difference that this will bring and that we won't simply see a, a redirecting of our valuable resources by the Labour Police and Crime Commissioner into other parts of the West Midlands? Yeah. Well, can I thank my right honourable friend? She raised a really important point. The Antisocial Behaviour Action Plan will help us crack down uh, and make sure on, on antisocial behaviour and make sure that those responsible conduct and undergo repairs within 48 hours, things like uh, cleaning up litter and, and graffiti. In terms of the West Midlands uh, enhanced hotspot, I'm delighted they'll be getting that additional funding. Uh, it is, she's right, for the PCCs to, de to, de to determine the precise allocation of funding, but I'm sure she'll make her representations in the usual powerful way. Mary Glyndon. Thank you, Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker. Announcing her retirement, North Tyneside born Sarah Hunter, MBE, played her final game of rugby at the opening women's Six Nations match at Kingston Park last Saturday. Sarah is the most capped international rugby player in the world, a true professional, great ambassador for her sport, and an inspiration to so many. Will the Deputy Prime Minister join with me, the whole of North Tyneside and this House, in thanking Sarah for all she has achieved for the country and her beloved sport of rugby? Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Can I, can, I, can I thank the Honourable Lady? She's absolutely right. I pay tribute to the trailblazing record of Sarah. I had the opportunity a few years ago to watch the England female rugby team. I was blown away, uh, and we look forward to her and them going on to bigger and better things. Richard Fuller. Madam Deputy Speaker, oh, oh, shush. Uh, will the government require that the East West Rail Company publish a full business case before the allocation of any more taxpayers' money to the project? Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you. It's a hugely important project with all sorts of opportunities, jobs, education, uh, and uh, a projected increase in economic output by over 100 billion by 2050. He's right that it needs all the transparency uh, and scrutiny. Uh, I know that the first stage of the project is already uh, in construction, on time and under budget. I'm told that the subsequent stages will go through full scrutiny as part of the planning process in a transparent way. David Linder. Let's leave Prime Minister's questions or Deputy Prime Minister's questions as it was today at this point and welcome our guests for this part of Politics Live. For the Government, Helen Waitley, Care Minister, Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland, Labour, Ian Murray and Nick Hurdley, the BBC's Chief Political Correspondent. Welcome to all of you. Well, it was a pretty bad-tempered, angry exchanges between Angela Rayner and Dominic Raab, uh, the deputies for both the Government and Labour. Angela Rayner saying she uh, asked uh, Dominic Raab 
Raab whether he thinks more bullies will be brought to justice as part of the government's antisocial behaviour strategy because she said he knows firsthand about intimidating behaviour, pressing the bruise, of course, of the investigation into bullying allegations against Dominic Raab. He responded by saying he'd never used the word scum, referring to Angela Rayner, describing Tories as such. What did you make of it? It was heated, wasn't it? Mm. It was um, not a... Not a quiet kickabout for, for the deputies. No. I, I noticed that Dominic, Rab, Dominic Rab's voice at certain points sounded utterly furious. Um, I mean, the background to this is obviously the investigation that Adam Tolley KC is overseeing, looking into various allegations against Dominic Rab, which he's denied. Um, my understanding is that is in its final stages. We don't know when it's going to come back, but various people close to the process think it could be pretty soon, which is, I think, why... It was brought up today and there was that ribbing towards the end mm. from Angela Rayner where she said this might be your last uh, your last outing at Deputy Prime Minister's questions. But um, no love lost there, I, I suspect. Well, no, absolutely. Angela Rayner is saying, will he walk before he's pushed? We're going to move on and discuss uh, the government's plans, which are going to be unveiled shortly. We'll bring you a bit of it from uh, the Commons um, if there is any further information from the Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick. And this is about... Uh, a plan, Helen Waitley, to house migrants who come across uh, the channel in small boats in RAF bases or barges or ferries. But let's concentrate uh, on the RAF uh, bases. Now, it's been reported that it'll be for new arrivals only. Uh, can you confirm that? So we'll have the statement from the Immigration Minister very soon, which will set out the details of this. I think a really important thing to say is that we know that the, at the moment we're paying a huge amount of money to house asylum seekers in hotels. About £6 million we, pounds about a day, according to day. the government. That yep. comes to around £2 billion a year. It's about £150 pounds per person per night. Mm. None of us want that to be happening. That's not a good use of taxpayers' money. So while in parallel we've got the work going on to stop the boats, this is in the short term to reduce some of those costs of housing migrants and to find cheaper places, more appropriate places for them to be living. How will it reduce the overall costs, though, Helen Waitley? I mean, if we're talking about new arrivals only, um, and yes, the detail will come, although it's been briefed across all the papers pretty well uh, before Parliament, so somebody's been talking about these plans, um, how will it actually take down the bill? Well, I said at the moment, and as you confirmed as well, around £6 million a day. So housing people outside hotels, for instance, on military bases, should be able to bring those costs down, be lower cost accommodation. Of course, people should be in appropriate accommodation. That's what we should do as a country. We want to bring those costs hand in hand. We'll know because it was announced before in the work overall uh, from the government to reduce some of the delays and backlogs and speed up clearing through those asylum claims. So that needs to happen. And as I said a moment ago, we're also working on new legislation to stop the boats and to deter the people smugglers from bringing people here in the first place. We want to smash that business model and that awfully dangerous route that people are taking to get here. I mean, so far it hasn't acted as a deterrent, despite the endless discussion about whether it'll be flights to Rwanda. Now it's about whether you're going to move uh, migrants out of hotels and onto ships. We can show you a couple of the front pages. We showed them at the beginning, but here's the Sun uh, exclusive. Uh, they say illegal migrants plan, oh, ship. Small boat arrivals to live on barges to cut three and a half billion pound hotel bill. I think we can roll on to the mail. Migrants to be housed on cruise ships and barges. Ministers unveiling plans as uh, we discuss it here on the programme. And the Times, hundreds of migrants to be housed in giant barges. So is that what's going to happen? It's going to be RF bases, barges, ferries? Is that the plan? The, the way it's going to be done, I'm sure we will hear more from the Immigration Minister on that in the statement to the House of Commons. That's where it should uh, be, be set out and he'll be asked, I'm sure, exactly the kind of questions you're asking me here and now. The important thing is this is about reducing the money that we're spending on accommodation for migrants, for asylum seekers, hand in hand with what we're bringing forwards to try and stop those right. boats overall. Sure. But there'll be details from uh, Robert Jenrick, uh, the Minister, about barges, about the ferries, about where they're going to be brought in from, how many um, asylum seekers or, or refugees they're going to be home by him now. Are there? Well, what I know is that Robert Jenrick's been working incredibly hard. He's a fantastic minister at gripping yeah. the detail. Yeah. So I'm sure that he will be answering it's all... many of those sorts of questions mm. from people in the chamber. Well, it's all over the front pages, though, in those headlines. So presumably we are going to get those details. Or is it that this plan just hasn't really been worked out 
and it's just been briefed to the press to get a headline? I wouldn't say so. As I, as I, I know from working with Robert Jenner as Immigration Minister, you know, he well, is fantastic at getting a grip of the detail. He's been working really hard on this, I know, with support of the Prime Minister. Well, sure because this is something hard. we know that mm. my, no, my constituents talk to me about this, the right. unhappiness about asylum seekers in hotels. Sure. They, we want people to be in better value accommodation hand in hand with while we stop the boats. Do we know? Do we have any firm details of what's been written here in the... Uh, yes. So I think there's going to be a couple of military bases announced at least um, in Lincolnshire and Essex. Um, I'm not sure we're going to get any details on ferries or barges because none have been acquired yet, mm. which makes it quite hard to announce. And Helen, I just wonder, given the cost that you'd incur on buying boats and then mooring them around the country and then keeping people on them, is that really going to bring down the bill? And are you going to be able to convince the Foreign Secretary that it's a good idea to have a big base in his constituency with several hundred asylum seekers or migrants? Well, I, mean, I understand uh, individual MPs putting a point of view across from their constituents, but as a government, we have to take steps to reduce the cost of accommodation for migrants. We know that the bill is far too high at the moment, as we said, coming to about £2 billion a year, £150 a night per person. While we have got these numbers of migrants and asylum seekers here in accommodation, we've got to reduce that cost. So, of course, this is the approach that the Immigration Minister will set out hand in hand with taking the steps to stop the, those boats. The work we're doing with France, for instance, mm. to, uh, to, to stop people coming over here in the first place and deterring people with right. shifting legislation so you can't come here Do and seek asylum if you come through an illegal route. Um, it, oh, sorry. Go on. I didn't have a question. Oh, I thought you were, were going to say something. I can come up with one. Ian, um, would you welcome this proposal? Would you take on this proposal? Well, the bottom line here is, and you've just mentioned it at the start of this package, it's about the front pages. Uh, we have a senior government minister here who doesn't know any of the detail because it's been briefed to the press in order to get those front pages. Now, we haven't seen the detail. The, the minister's on, the, on his feet uh, at the moment. But the, the genesis of this problem is the 166,000 applications at the Home Office that haven't been processed. That yeah. was 19,000 when Labour left office in 2010. And you just can't keep adding to that number because you've then got to put people somewhere. So the way you resolve this problem is to put your resources not into hotel accommodation and barges and ah. the Foreign Secretary's um, constituency. You put you, the money into the Home Office to get the asylum uh, backlog cleared and therefore you deal with people so they don't need hotel accommodation or barges because they're either in the system in the country or they're not. What would you do? Uh, with 50,000 or so migrants, asylum seekers who are here in hotels, those are government figures, while they're being processed? Well, you've got to process them now. We're in the situation. Yeah, but where would you got. house them? You don't, you well, don't want to pay for the hotel accommodation. You just said you don't want to put them well, on ferries, barges that well, hasn't been acquired yet, but at RAF bases that members of the cabinet don't want either. Where would you put them? Well, look, they're here already, but you right. have to make yeah. sure you process their applications now. I mean, this bill, this two billion pounds a year bill for people in hotel accommodation, has to come down. And the only way to have it coming down is to not have people in there. And the only way you don't have people in hotel accommodation or barges is to process their applications. If this hundred and sixty-six thousand keeps rising because the stop the boats uh, legislation is not going to work. The legislation last year didn't work. Well, the legislation before that didn't provide a deterrent. And therefore you have to stop people making that dangerous journey by going after the criminal gangs, put money into the National Crime Agency to go right after the criminal gangs and then deal with the backlog of asylum cases here. Until you do that, you'll just be having more barges, more hotels, and it just think numbers will just keep increasing. Well, I mean, we're in agreement on the importance of dealing with the backlog, and that's why we've already taken steps to speed up the processing, up. extra staff going that into the Home Office to, to do that and to speed up that. But in the meantime, you've got to house people somewhere. And I think I'm of the view it's simply not OK to continue spending the level of money well, that we're having to spend on housing people. I simply haven't heard an alternative well, to you from, from Labour as what you would do well, about the, that. The, the people that are coming to this country do have to be housed. In fact, in yeah. Edinburgh, where, my where own city, there's a cruise ship, the Ukrainians, mm. in mm -hmm. it at the moment mm -hmm. because there's an adequate number of, of houses available in Edinburgh to be able to take Ukrainians. So there is an option there. We have to see the details. I, I, if the minister can't comment on the details, how I can't 
can't be expected. No, I'm not asking you to comment policy. on the details. What I'm asking but is what Labour would do is, instead, bearing in mind 51,000 or so people the, the, are yeah, here. The principle is you have to deal with the backlog to get the number of people who are waiting. Right. 450 days on average for an adult to yeah. have their asylum claim process, 550 for a child. If that keeps increasing, the numbers keep increasing, this problem just keeps getting worse. Well, you have to find more and more accommodation. Well, let's, th let's look at the cost because, Helen, you've said that's the priorities, to bring down that huge hotel bill. Well, Alex Wickham, journalist, has just said exclusive Home Office rejected plan to put migrants on ships, barges last year because it could be more expensive than using hotels. Leaked documents show costs of 100,000 an hour to more ships. Officials warned it could surpass £7 million a day for hotels. The existing bill, well, that, that, that would be a farce, wouldn't it? Then? So what we need to do is secure accommodation, and we've talked about military bases, for instance, where the cost is lower than the cost of keeping people in hotels. Yeah, but two we bases... Know that hotels mm. is not the right way forward. No, but the two bases, uh, Nick mentioned one in James Cleverley's uh, constituency, and uh, there is a second one in Lincolnshire. Both of those would take a few thousand, possibly up to 4,000. There are 51 thousand asylum seekers, refugees, already in those 400 or so hotels and more crossings coming over. So There's that's a huge why gap. we have to do the all, all three things. One is oh. get lower cost accommodation. Another is faster processing of the asylum claims, which we are taking steps to do. And the third is fundamentally to stop the boats coming here in the first place. So to make sure that we are not having people seeing it as an opportunity to come here, but instead, if you come here illegally, to know that actually you won't be able to apply but for it's, asylum. But it's not cheaper. We've just seen that leaked documents from the whole office show it's not cheaper. So the only conclusion you can come to if it's not cheaper is it's about those headlines on the newspapers that are sitting in front of the table here. Uh, there are already other reports about Afghan refugees being moved out of hotels and being given uh, some sort of permanent um, accommodation. Is this, is there a sense that the government is trying desperately to meet and match its rhetoric when it comes to the issue of immigration and migrants? Um, and the detail is falling far behind. Well, I mean, it's certainly upping its rhetoric on it, and this week has all been about trying to persuade the public that there's a there's a plan to bring down the hotels bill. I mean, part of the question, I think, is given the backlog and the number of people in hotels already, are you actually going to bring that bill down significantly mm. with the people who are already in hotels, or is that going to continue? I've just seen there, there are actually more sites than the two we mentioned. Ah, there will be... This is for the RAF to, bases. That's right. There's going to be some other um, ex-military sites used for that as well. But nothing concrete in terms of the vessels that were being floated in the... Excuse the terrible phrase, pun. Yeah. Um, were being floated in the papers this morning. But look, I mean, I think that is the, the crux of the, the accusation you hear against the government here, is that there is some really tough rhetoric and there is some work going on, but it's not enough to meet the scale of the problem. And some would suggest that it sounds a bit like politics rather than an actual plan. Let's look at this headline in the Daily Mail. Labour bans Corbyn three years after backing him to be the next Prime Minister. This is the story yesterday that the uh, ruling national executive uh, under Keir Starmer um, have said that Jeremy Corbyn cannot stand as a Labour candidate in his constituency in North London at the next general election. Uh, Ian Murray, why did Keir Starmer serve in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet? Well, he served as Brexit shadow secretary well, at a time that. where Brexit was going through. It was an incredibly important position to have and, in fact, um, a very successful position yeah. given in what happened in Parliament and the way that Parliament operated. But, look, the Equality and Human Rights Commission report into anti-Semitism in the Labour Party it should shame us all. Mm -hmm. And anybody who wishes to defend it, that is not the place that the Labour Party should be in. Keir said at the start of his leadership he would root this cancer yeah. out of the party. Yeah. He has done yeah. so. Yeah. Um, not, nothing to celebrate. Yeah. It's, a, it's a badge of shame. Mm. Jeremy Corbyn refuses mm. to to accept that report, uh, refuses to accept sure. that there was anti-Semitism in the party, despite the report telling us that there was, yes, but and Ke therefore but has broken Starmer, the rules of the Keir party. But Keir Starmer could have done what you did. You, you, you left uh, your front bench role. Uh, you took a stand about what you have just outlined in terms of your feelings uh, towards Jeremy Corbyn. He didn't. I mean, he, he said, I'm 100% behind Jeremy Corbyn. That's what Keir Starmer said in October 2019. And here he is saying he's kicked him out anyway in terms of uh, taking away the whip. And now he's saying he can't stand as a Labour candidate. What changed? Well, he's quite right to do that because right. the Equality yeah. and Human yeah. Rights Commission report was I pretty clear. I know why, but what I'm asking is what's changed with Keir Starmer? 
What's changed with Keir Starmer? He said Jeremy Corbyn was the best thing since sliced bread. And now he's but saying he doesn't even deserve to stand as a Labour candidate. What's changed is that Keir Starmer said he would root this cancer out of the Labour Party. He's changed the Labour Party. There was a set of conditions on Mr Corbyn mm. in terms mm -hmm. of him remaining within the Parliamentary Labour Party. <laughs> Mr Corbyn's refused over the last two years to meet those very straightforward and simple conditions. And therefore he doesn't but... have the right, like any member of the Parliamentary <laughs> Labour Party, myself or otherwise, to be a, a member of that Parliamentary Labour Party if he's unwilling to abide by the rules and therefore he will not be well, let, a candidate. Let's, That's let, pretty clear. Let's let's listen to what Keir Starmer said once he was uh, elected as the leader of the Labour Party. I want to pay tribute to Jeremy Corbyn, who led our party through some really difficult times, who energised our movement, and who's a friend as well as a colleague. And to all of our members, supporters and affiliates, I say this. Whether you voted for me or not, I will represent you. I will listen to you and I will bring our party together. He's a friend. I mean, he said he's going to stand up for him. I mean, it's hypocritical, isn't it, at the very least, to have said those things just a few years ago. The report was already underway. Um, I mean, Keir Starmer was well aware of the allegations around anti-Semitism, and yet he gives this gushing endorsement of Jeremy Corbyn instead of walking away even when he became leader. I think it's credit to Keir Starmer who has come in to change the party, to root out anti-Semitism and has been successful in that. I never want to knock on a door at a general election again and have a long, lifelong Jewish Labour voter slam the door in my face because of anti-Semitism. So Keir has rooted that out. The Equality and Human Rights Commission has now come back and stopped putting the Labour Party into special measures and therefore we're now in a position whereby the party's changed and Keir has taken the party forward and Mr Corbyn doesn't deserve well, has to be it a taken Labour it party forward? member not, of Parliament. What about uniting the party? I heard the Labour MP yesterday, John McDonnell, who served as Shadow Chancellor under Jeremy Corbyn, John Landsman, who founded Momentum, the grassroots organisation that very much supported uh, Jeremy Corbyn. They're all furious. They all say it's a terrible mistake in terms of unifying the party ahead of the next general election. The issues around anti-Semitism were a cancer in the party. Uh, Keir Starmer has dealt with that and if, if Jeremy Corbyn has a set of conditions that he had to meet in order to satisfy the Equality and Human Rights Commission report, he has failed and refused to meet them and therefore is no longer a member of the Parliamentary Labour Party and then unable to stand at the election. John Landsman incidentally also said yesterday he would still be campaigning yes. for and backing Labour to win the next general election to make Keir Starmer uh, Prime Minister. So the party's changed. We've moved on. We've moved on from John McDonald, we've moved on from John Lansman, we've moved on from oh, Jeremy Corbyn met... and we're ready to take power in this country with a positive policy platform with Keir Starmer as Prime Minister. Yeah, and I remember when Jeremy Corbyn was Labour leader and there was various talk of deselection of MPs like you and you were all furious. You all said it was a stitch up and it was Corbyn acting out with the rules. It didn't happen, but it does seem to be happening now under Keir Starmer, isn't it just hypocrisy from different wings of the party. No, it's not. It's about showing the party's change and dealing with it. Look, if somebody breaks the rules in any organisation, the BBC included, then you end up in a situation whereby action has to be taken. There's a very simple set of conditions that Jeremy Corbyn has to meet to have stayed a member of the Parliamentary Labour Party. Oh. He's refused to meet them, I, including right, admitting... You, hang on, hang on. I said we were going to hear from the, the Immigration party. Minister Robert Jenrick because we had a long uh, discussion about plans in terms of housing migrants. Let's have a listen. The government will use military sites being disposed of in Essex and Lincolnshire and a separate site in East Sussex. These will be scaled up over the coming months and will collectively provide accommodation to several thousand asylum seekers through repurposed, repurposed barrack blocks and porter cabins. In addition, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is showing leadership on this issue by bringing forward proposals to provide accommodation at Catterick Garrison Barracks in his constituency. And we're continuing to explore the possibility of accommodating migrants in vessels, as they are in Scotland and in the Netherlands. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to be clear. These sites on their own will not end the use of hotels overnight. But alongside local dispersal and other forms of accommodation, which we will bring forward in due course, they will relieve pressure on our communities. 
I mean, Helen, listening to that, he mentioned, Robert Jenrick, a couple of the military sites which we knew about, but he's exploring the possibility of vessels. These are not concrete plans or details for how to deal with the issue of housing migrants in hotels, is it? So he set out four sites. I picked that up, right? Yeah, um, several of, thousand, of, and I've said uh, there are over 51,000. And I think it's right to be open and, and, and clearly uh, that we, we need to, people need to know what's going on, where those sites are going to be, and there's a process to make sure that asylum seekers, migrants can be so, housed so there. So this is absolutely the, the right thing to do, to be clear to people. We're not happy with the situation of people being housed in hotels, and this is what we're doing to have an alternative place for people to be housed. As I said before, how, how, hand we, how, hand how fleshed out are these proposals? The if you were just listening to Robert Jenrick there, would you say that these are fully-fledged proposals that are going to be put in place anytime soon. I have absolute confidence in Robert Jenrick and his work on this. And actually, we listened to him for two minutes if, at best then. Mm. So I, think those were the, I think those were the best bits. It wasn't possible bit. to hear the whole of the details because we'd have to listen to more of what he's setting out and the questions that he'll answer uh, during the course of the statement. Right. I mean, the detail, the detail isn't there. Um, is what I'm being told from what we've heard from uh, Robert Jenrick. I suppose that isn't really a surprise. No. Um, coming months seems like quite a long piece of string at the moment. Several thousand, don't know how much that is and how that, how much of a chunk out of the 51,000 backlog that would actually potentially fill. Was interesting, I thought, that Rishi Sunak's committed to doing some of this in his own constituency, but again, well, let's see the numbers. Well, Edward Lee, uh, the Conservative MP, has said he's going to fight the plans uh, for migrants to be housed in his uh, constituency. That's all we have time for. Thank you very much to my guests uh, for joining me here today on Politics Live. I'll be back tomorrow with more at 12.15 on BBC Two and the BBC iPlayer from all of us here. Bye-bye.